thank you. Um, and the spinal fluid has its own accumulation curve. It doesn't grow. Um, and so we looked at gray matter and white matter. We tried to normalize this same way that Gould did. Look what happens. If you look at the unnormalized data for body weight and height, you get ex almost exactly the same numbers that Paul Broca did in the 1860s. If you normalize for weight and height of these same children, you end up with Gould's difference. Both were right. For reasons I still can't quite remember, we then uh, looked at the ratio of brain uh, to spinal fluid and look at what you end up finding. You end up showing that there is a completely universal relationship between uh, brain to fluid. And it takes a curve, but by age adjustment, it doesn't matter at any age when you pick this. It doesn't matter whether you're male or female. It doesn't matter whether you're large or small. Your body regulates this ratio to be very, very tightly regulated. We just stumbled into this and we don't understand the physiology yet, but realize this is what we change neurosurgically when we go and drain fluid in a child with hydrocephalus. So we recently published uh, brain growth curves. Uh, for males and females, and we also publish the ratios. You can use these like growth charts. There's a wonderful paper in Nature about two weeks ago. Uh, Ed Bullmore from uh, Cambridge in the UK had been one of the leaders on this, but it's a worldwide group of scientists looking at these kinds of charts throughout the lifespan. Uh, all the way up to 100 years of age. Very, very interesting paper. I don't think any of them are clinicians, so they didn't quite get what I will talk to you here in a minute. Now, there's a lot of symmetry in the brains of normal children, uh, frontal lobes, parietal lobes, cerebellum, uh, and asymmetry in the brain is amazing. You know, uh, even insects have asymmetric neural systems. Uh, and non-human primates, of course. And there's a wonderful set of writings of Norman Geschwind, if you're interested in such things. So audience participation. Uh, what's not symmetric in a brain? The hemispheres look pretty significant. Come on, shy people, I need more than three or four. It's not statistical. If you're going to attend lectures, um, you know, show up. You're failing us here. I do a lot better in other countries. Come on. No way, huh? All right. Well, um, all right. One more person. So what's bigger, the uh, left or the right temporal lobe? Huge controversy, by the way, in the literature. Octopuses have asymmetric brains. All right, the folks who are brave enough to actually turn on their videos, who thinks the left is larger? One, two, three, four, everybody? Gee. Naren, what do you think? Left or right? It's 50-50. but what the heck? All right. It's not close. The left temporal lobe is very significantly larger from early in childhood all the way through to 18 years of age. How about the hippocampus? Who thinks left? I need a show of hands. Who thinks left and who thinks right? Let's do left first. One hand. Who thinks right? That's why you all do well on standardized tests. You try to gain the psychology of the question, don't you? It's not close at all. It's the right. Now, why does this matter? If you look in the literature, there's a huge literature on cerebral lateralization for language. Why we tend to have language in our left hemispheres, no one really understands. But if you were doing epilepsy surgery, you're looking for these patients where there's one damaged 
hippocampus and temporal lobe and everything else is pretty normal. How do you know it's normal? If you go into your conferences on epilepsy, a radiologist, hopefully with a little gray hair and a lot of experience will tell you that this side is asymmetric with this side. Ask that radiologist, if you're brave, how do they know that the other side is normal for age? We've got the data now. So it's very interesting. So let's go back to hydrocephalus. If any of you trained to be a pediatric neurosurgeon, um, the conversation always goes back to hydrocephalus. And let's go to the developing world. So this is a baby in Northern Uganda. And if you look at the fontanelle, it's sunken in after a successful endoscopic treatment for hydrocephalus. Um, I have two kids in clinic. I have a male at nine months, a female at six months. Audience participation. Which one do you think is doing better? One has larger ventricles than the other. Who thinks this child is doing better with a thicker cortical mantle? One, two, three hands, four. Naren, which one do you think is, be is doing better, left or right? Um, it's the, it's a, it's a, I presume this is a right to me, the female six months. Um, Very good. The, you, you see, you guys have to be careful as students. I put these scans up, scaled to their actual head size. Notice that the male here is older, but the head is smaller. Most of us early on, if actually, even if we get a little older in neurosurgery, we look at the thickness of the brain. This child, and these are endoscopically treated, so they tend to run with larger ventricles. The mantle is thinner, but you need to know the volume of the brain and you can't do that in your head. This baby only has a brain two thirds of the size that a nine month old should have. And its scale of infant development is terrible. This young lady has a brain that's almost normal for growth at this age. And her developmental indexes are almost normal as well. Now it's not very good to stretch a brain, but it's brain growth that ends up determining what you can do. So in neurosurgery, we drain fluid for these kids, but the goal might ought to be to grow a really good brain from these children. And where are these children? Well, they're not in the United Kingdom. There are about 400,000 new childhood cases of hydrocephalus around the world each year. Over 95% of these cases are in the developing world. And the largest contributing cause is infection early in life. These are children who tend to have neonatal sepsis. And if they survive their sepsis, then they might be able to live long enough to get hydrocephalus. So for 15 years, I've collaborated with a number of places in Africa, but the principal place I call home is the Chil Cure Children's Hospital of Uganda in a town called Mbali, Uganda. Uh, these are the hands of Dr. Ben Worf, one of my heroes and mentors, who's pioneered the use of endoscopy in the developing world, where you really don't wanna put a plastic shunt under the skin of a malnourished child in a rural setting that can't come back for emergency care. My friend, Dr. Magamba is on morning rounds, examining one of several infants, all with the same story. They're two or three months of age. They come into the hospital after being normal at birth, getting a bad febrile illness in the first few weeks of life, surviving it, and then their heads are growing. So what do you do if you're a surgeon? Well, you make the surgery better. So we've gotten pretty seriously into this. The first report of a randomized trial of endoscopic versus shunting for infant hydrocephalus in these post-infectious hydrocephalics, uh, we put this into uh, the New England Journal of Medicine a few years back. Uh, we found that endoscopic treatment um, seems equivalent to shunt, which means we prefer endoscopy. Babies come in with small brains. They're below the normal growth curves. When the pressure's relieved, a 
over the first year, about a quarter of them bounce up into the normal range and they're doing well cognitively. As we follow these children out beyond a year to two years, and now we're doing the five-year data, their growth is stagnating. What does that tell you? Well, surgery for end-stage disease of the brain um, can only have limited palliative effects. So what causes most of this? If you walk into an operating room in much of Sub-Saharan Africa for these post-infectious hydrocephalics, uh, or if you it, walk into the room where I've seen the same appearance in Hanoi in Southeast Asia, or my colleagues who work in the Caribbean report to me, this is a very typical appearance of one of these post-infectious hydrocephalics. You see pustules lining the appendum of the third ventricle on endoscopy. You go through the floor of the third ventricle, it is typically pristine. These children have had a primary brain infection, a ventriculitis, not a meningitis. We have no idea what causes this. And so uh, with funding from our NIH director, we were able to put in the kind of sampling you could do in the UK. We put a cryogenic infrastructure together in a country that um, lacked one and that often didn't have reliable electricity. Uh, we sorted all these samples, often stored in liquid nitrogen doers, uh, packed it into these large commercial liquid nitrogen dry shippers. And then they arrive usually five and a half days out of their six day cryogenic uh, uh, lifespan uh, safely at our labs. Uh, we bit a lot of fingernails off. Uh, waiting to see if they'll get there in time. And what do you do with infections when you can't culture an organism? Well, we have techniques for this now. Every bacterium has genes like this 16S ribosome, which you don't have as a human. We can amplify that gene and then sequence a piece of it. And we have huge databases now that can identify basically all bacteria. Well, these babies also have viruses, fungi, and parasites. And so for that, we look at the RNA and deeply sequence that. We finally figured out what's in most of these Ugandan infants. It's a painy bacillus. And if you know, have any of you heard of a painy bacillus? Don't feel bad. Uh, painy bacillus means almost a bacillus in Greek or Latin. These things used to be uh, classified with bacilli, like anthrax is a bacillus, very difficult to grow, very easy to pick up with genomics, devastating brain infections. Um, and if we look at the bottom of the post-infectious kids, I mean, the non, these are congenital cases on the bottom. Um, this is non-diagnostic, slightly older kids with occasional calcified abscesses. Here are the ones where we have good diagnoses and can prove it's painy bacillus. These are all babies under 90 days of age. Their heads are filled with calcified abscesses. Very unusual in the UK to see any newborn uh, with abscesses like this. If we put the reference strain into mouse volunteers, the, uh, the well-known typical strain of this bacteria is harmless. We put these strains that we get out of the African babies, it kills the mice in a day or two. We've assembled the genome from several of these isolates, and it has picked up some nasty virulence factors, as well as, unfortunately, antibiotic resistance as well. And these cases come from this swampy region uh, along the north banks of Lake Victoria and the north and south banks of Lake Choga, where the Nile spends a little bit of a rest day before it goes on to Lake Albert and further north. And these cases are the tip of the iceberg, or in Africa, the tooth of the hippopotamus. Um, we see the, only the children who survive these infections. The bigger problem is neonatal sepsis, which still kills upwards of a million babies a year around the planet. And we finally cracked the linkage problem. So with 1,300 cases that we've studied in the last few years, this is a normal ultrasound. 
a linear probe that looks magnified, and what the CAT scan looks like at two months of age. Here's a baby with diagnosed painy bacillus and a little early cyst you can see in the frontal lobe. The baby comes back a month later after apparently being cleared of the infection in the periphery with a calcified abscess in that frontal lobe and hydrocephalus and evidence of substantial brain destruction. Here's another infant diagnosed painy bacillus. Uh, again, these are one week old babies. Um, significant areas of destruction in the cortex, both gray and white matter, terrible destruction two months later. Both of these cases, when they came in, still have active painy bacillus in their brains. So that's a brief taste of what we do uh, in our work, both in the US, in Europe, and uh, in Africa and Asia. Uh, I say we because no one can do this kind of work on their own. We have large, very, very good teams of committed physicians and scientists uh, on, well, I guess, five different continents right now, working very hard with us to try to better understand uh, not just how to treat, but how to prevent a lot of this neurosurgical burden that presently um, we'll never operate our way out of. So thank you all so much for joining in and especially those brave enough to turn on their videos. I'm happy to answer questions now or to wait after uh, Dr. Narenthi has given his presentation. Yeah, if you guys want to turn off, uh, turn on your microphones and go for questions now or just put them in the chat and I'll read them out. I'm happy to do either way. And then we'll proceed with Narenthi and as well. Shy people. Steve, uh, Steve, Dr. Schiff, can I ask you a question while others are gearing up? Um, yes. Nirad, shall I go ahead? Yeah. Shall I ask the question. Great thing. You know, um, the nowadays the research has become so sophisticated. I mean, when I started, molecular biology was. Now, when I started twenty-five years ago, molecular biology was you know, not the big, big thing in um, research, or as far as I saw it, there were lots of more simpler research that was available for medical students to get used to, or, you know, you could easily get into one area and try to now, the, the depth of research, research uh, technology knowledge is so deep. Um, how long does it take nowadays for someone to even get into one specific area of research. Um, that's my question. I think that's a great point, Naren. Uh, I'm like the rest of you. I'm trained as a clinician. Mm -hmm. And if you're a clinician, the thing that you do is you're the expert on the diseases mm -hmm. that you treat. And diseases that people don't understand that you treat every day, there is no one else that's likely to be able to coordinate solving problems. I, I can barely spell DNA. I do a little better now. But I went and knocked on doors. And I'll tell you all, you know, my experience is you go to world famous people, you knock on their door and you say, I've got a problem. I'm dealing with thousands of infants dying of devastating brain infections in Africa. And I wondered if you might be willing to uh, help work with us. I never finished that sentence. I've never approached anyone who's any good who hasn't basically interrupted me and said, I'm in, what do you need? And now I'm a children's doctor. One of the reasons I treat children is because I don't have to think twice getting up in the middle of the night. Somebody calls me at two in the morning and they had a sick baby or an injured baby. Yeah, I'll be right there. And, but it's a universal, non political set of questions. And I've been the little, the babies are lucky because I go around and I try to find who are the specialists that can help us solve what 
people call wickedly difficult problems. No one person can do anything with these diseases, and yet they're tractable. And I'll leave you folks with that thought. Um, that's, that's my response to your really important question. Who else has a question? You guys can't do medicine and be shy. Um, hi, Dr. Schiff. I had a question. Mm -hmm. um, my question was um, with regards to the hydrocephalus that you treat in Uganda, um, is it like different to the, I'm um, probably like, because the uh, hydrocephalus that you see in babies born with Zika virus or like when their mothers had Zika, or is that like different? I'm only first here, so I don't know. Do you know where the Zika forest is, Maya? Uh, yeah, it's a virus that affects pregnant women, and then it can affect baby, uh, their babies. Forest. Yes, the forest is in Uganda. I've been there. I, I could show you photos of the Zika forest. So Zika is a virus that's been in Africa for eons. We don't know how long. Um, but the hydrocephalus in Zika has a very unique pattern. And we study post-infectious hydrocephalus, although now I'm also contrasting that with congenital and spina bifida babies in, um, in Uganda. Um, but people are different. The pathogens are different in many places. I never would have imagined that the vast majority, well over 50% of the infants with this condition in Uganda have one organism that causes it. And, uh, but you also have to worry about the gene background, the ancestral background of people. We just ran at ridiculous expense, 1200 genomes uh, for ancestry determination on these Ugandan babies. And it looks like we indeed can map that. And so when you think of infectious disease, you also, whether it's viral or bacterial, it's not just bad, pathogens out there that infect us. Every one of us tends to have a different sensitivity to be infected and to have good or bad outcomes. And that can segregate out by your basic genetic background from ancestry. So we're busy creating those maps and then we'll compare those maps to uh, the map of risk for these various conditions. But yes, you need to know what the pathogens are before you can both diagnose and especially better treat and prevent such disease. Thank you very much. Sure. I want to leave time for Dr. Narenthian. Uh, any yeah. other burning questions? I have, yeah, a I have, got, a, I have got a question, Steve. Uh, um, Steve, is it now possible for a physician I don't know about physicians, but surgeons to be um, in cutting edge research and full time clinical post. Um, in other words, to do research when you're full time clinical? Yeah. I think so. Uh, the way that it can only be approached is that you treat your operating room clinic and ICU as your laboratory mm -hmm. and focus your skills and acquire some skills that will let you study disease and outcomes uh, in those laboratory environments. There's a huge advantage to that because the basic scientist doesn't have access to your patients. What you do, it's so useful to pick up some additional tools to keep you rigorous, such as statistics, such as trial design. Um, these are fundamentals that uh, I, I have um, a number of colleagues who've gone and done a one-year master's degree in uh, public health statistics, and it enables them not just to do really fine medical research in their clinical environments, but it enables them to read our own literature in case no one has noticed. 
the medical literature is becoming dreadfully impossible to understand, even in neurosurgery. And some of that's good because of rigor, but it's a major challenge for all of us to be able to understand the methods uh, that are written down in our papers and to know which ones have results that are strong and which ones are weak. Oh, good. Excellent. Good. So thank you very much uh, for inviting me uh, to give this talk. It's an honor, honor and privilege uh, to talk to medical students uh, because you are the future. I was once uh, and um, I look forward to in years to come to see your contributions and I will, I will, um, I will have great vicarious uh, uh, pressure seeing you all become the next generations of leaders and physicians. So I'm going to talk about um, medical student research abroad, my experience and how I see it uh, to give you some pointers how you might want to approach it. Uh, so the first question is um, why? Uh, why go abroad? Um, and uh, I think there are a couple of main reasons. And I was absolutely determined that I was going to go and do research. Um, I did research in Britain and outside Britain. It's, it's, it's uh, mainly because as I will come to it, I hope this, um, uh, let's see, the holistic reason. The reason is that, um, um, you know, it, it broadens your professional horizons. So what I mean by that is that I looked through many previous giants in neurosurgery and medicine. Um, they have all gone to different places. You will realize that at some point that it's very hard to come up with a very unique idea. What you do is that you'll see lots of different ideas and then in your brain, you start to form, you know, you kind of synthesize and come up with an, a, a new idea. And so it's important, I thought, that I need to go and see, uh, do research at different places and see different ideas. And also it broadens um, your horizons because I have worked, as you will see, uh, in not only in Britain, in Singapore, in Switzerland, in the uh, US and uh, you know, I met people from every every different uh, ethnic, religious, um, uh, cultural backgrounds. And, you know, I found that uh, very useful later on when I became a doctor to connect with my patients, connect with my colleagues that I come across later on in my country, as well as at, at meetings. And so I found uh, that having that broad sweep, very useful. And also personal growth. Uh, because um, I was in Aberdeen Medical School, I loved it to bits, but I knew the place inside out. I knew everyone inside out. And all of them at that time were my friends. And I wanted to go to different places, make my life harder and, I, and, and try to grow. So that was one of the things when you go to a new place, you have to learn to survive, learn to form new friends. Um, and, and the friends that you make in these... Uh, so Jones, you know, they stay with your life. And uh, you know, many of them are still my friends and many of them have helped. And I, when you are a medical student, I think that's the best time you are going to get to go and do um, research uh, elsewhere. You know, once you start clinical work, it really becomes very hard. I try that, I, I'll work this. Uh, Prezi, I hope I do. And um, so, but you know, that's the holistic side, but you know, in terms of goal, you're goal oriented, you want to experience research um, and learn new techniques and uh, certainly going to do an elective in a big, big uh, uh, research unit as I did. You know, I, got, I got the elective prize for neurology and neurosurgery, which helped me through my career. And, uh, and if you're working with uh, established uh, um, research groups, there's a good chance that you can get a, a paper out of it as well, which improves your CV. So there are two things. One is purely goal-oriented to improve your professional uh, career in a very narrow way. And the second one is a 
a holistic uh, uh, version that going to a foreign country, doing research and learning research, as well as very various other skills, which would become very useful when you become a leader uh, um, of your specialty later on, which you might not realize at the time. Sorry for get this. Okay. And as I said earlier, that if you look at, you know, you already saw Dr. Schiff having you know, professorships in UK, and I am an yeah, adjunct associate professor in his department. And if you look at most, not maybe not all, but most of the great giants of any field, you will find that they have spent time in different countries. Harvey Cushing was famously in Switzerland. He came to UK as well. He developed uh, the Cushing reflex from his time he spent in, with Cocker in Switzerland. It's always a bone of contention whether it's Cocker's work or it's Cushing's work, but that's for historians to say. Lindsay Simon, uh, who was the doyen of British neurosurgery, he was the last great British neurosurgeon. Since then, we have got subspecialization and we don't have those great masters who did everything. Uh, he was at London. He was originally from Aberdeen and uh, he spent his research in Australia. Dr. Harbour, who's the former chairman at Hershey, at, at Penn State, and now vice chair of uh, academic affairs in Penn State system, former president of the WAMS and the American and the surgeons of, uh, and the Society of Neurosurgeons, he spent um, research uh, in, uh, he did research in Copenhagen when he was a medical student or, or as a pre-medical pre student. Uh, who's Dufu that, you know, is a contemporary active neurosurgeon who's uh, from Montpellier, uh, trained in Paris, but he spent time in, with Dr. Mitch Berger uh, in UCSF um, and, uh, you know, pioneered or took the, the way craniotomy to different heights, particularly for low-grade gliomas. Neurosurgery is, uh, I'm from neurosurgery, so that's the world I know, and it's a very small world. Um, who's to who, who trained with uh, Mitch Berger. I, I spent time with uh, Mitch Berger in Seattle when he was the, the junior faculty of Dr. R Richard Wim, who was the chairman in Seattle, but he spent time in UK, uh, in Plymouth, then in Atkinson Morley. And, you know, I, I, I worked with him for two months and I tell you, you know, for him, and it is one small paradise when you work, do some research somewhere else and go back, you know, you have a, you know, that remains a paradise that sustains you for a long time. So now we look at why and what was my experience. I was a medical student in Aberdeen and I was absolutely sure before I went to medical school, I wanted to do research as well. I wanted it all. And uh, so uh, on the second uh, year, in the, in the summer of second, after my after finishing the second year of medical school in that summer holiday, I, I used to look at the, uh, I used to read nature and uh, uh, new scientists and go to the last pages and found any adverts for scholarships. And I found um, uh, a scholarship at the Scottish Home and Office Department and got them to fund me a, a summer student uh, research uh, scholarship uh, with the physiology department and worked on NMDA reception and got a paper out of it. So that was, I was then 19. Then the next summer came, I did a BSc as well uh, in pathology and then the next summer came, I, I got a welcome class scholarship and this time I went and did this at the Department of Neurosurgery in Atkinson Morley Hospital at St. George's. Um, that was then the neurosurgical department was then based in Wimbledon. And uh, that was a fantastic time that I had. And uh, that's when I decided that I was going to do neurosurgery. And neurosurgeon asked me, what am I going to do? I said, I'm going to do something in brain probably pathology. He said, well, you should think, you should do neurosurgery, go and sleep on it. And um, at the time uh, I was in the department, um, and the University of Washington used to send their residents to Seattle, to St. George's for a year of training. 
And uh, so Dr. Dick Wynn, Richard Wynn, he visited uh, the lab when I was in St. George's. And so I said to him, I want to do the elective in, in Seattle. So that's where then I ended up doing the elective in Seattle. He was very helpful. He was a very enthusiastic uh, leader. And you know, he, he really was uh, uh, brought up with the rest, medical students and residents. And so I spent a month in his clinical practice as an extern and a month research looking at the protective effect of magnesium and adenosine for head injury. We use rat models. We made burr holes in the skull and then connected this um, fluid um, filled piston, a piston that was uh, um, had a fluid filled of force system that caused head injuries. And then we looked at uh, the neuroprotection of, with magnesium and adenosine. Then for the, uh, the next summer, then I once again um, got the, uh, the Scottish Home and Office scholarship. This time internet was coming in and I did not know what internet or what, uh, um, what information superhighway was. So I managed to do a summer research on uh, summer project on using internet for medical education. And I got a national second prize in Scotland for the, the uh, index that I developed. That was before Google, if you wanted to go to neurosurgery, you had to come to Aberdeen Neurosurgery Index. It was, a, it was an index where people could come and put their neurosurgical website. So, uh, so that's what I did there, which then I carried on the use of internet for education throughout the career so far. Then for the last year, after I finished medical school, before I started uh, my internship, uh, I had a, a student scholarship at the University of Missouri, Columbia. Here I was developing a neurosurgery quiz on the internet. And uh, I did it from Aberdeen. Unfortunately, the, I used to carry a Sri Lankan passport then, and uh, I didn't get the US visa to go to Missouri to do the project in Missouri. Maybe life would have changed had I done that, but that's life. But because I had done a lot of research when I was a medical student and then started this Aberdeen Neurosurgery Index, a lot of people, a lot of all the senior neurosurgeons who created website, they used to write to me to have their website on my index. And so I used to put the testimonials from them on another page. And so Dr. Schiff, you know, Zervas, Patrick Kelly, um, you know, you name it, you know, who is who of neurosurgery at the, at the cutting edge, they would send this lovely email saying. And so the, the team in Singapore, when I was a final year medical student, invited me to come and work as a, a consultant for a 3D virtual um, uh, surgical system they were developing. This was involved in the 3D goggles. So it's all coming now, but it's actually started 25 years ago. and. Um, so that was a project between Singapore General Hospital, John Hopkins Radiology, and the University of Singapore. So I, and uh, when I was in Seattle, uh, one of the other fellows there was a neurosurgeon from, from Switzerland. This is what, how you get to know other people. So, so he also invited me to come and work in his lab, in his hospital. So I spoke to the postgraduate dean and after doing a six months house job, I went to Singapore for six months and then to Switzerland to University of Bern for six months. So this was my you know, medical student days of uh, research uh, that I did uh, in, uh, in uh, outside. Now, as I said, I did uh, the BS in angiogenesis in Aberdeen for a year. It was a purely research BSc. So this is my experience. And uh, the question is when to do it, as I said, you know, I certainly uh, used my summer holidays. I used to work in British customs and excise after my A level and my, after my first summer holiday, and they pay, that paid me a lot of money. But as I said, I went to the seven, you know, the the low low paid uh, summer studentships because I thought that was much more useful. I think if you look look at um, you know back of the journals. And also, if you to talk to any of your any of your um, lecturers, they will know 
the internal funding mechanism for getting summer student, student scholarships. And um, so certainly summer holidays, that wouldn't affect your studies. Um, certainly doing a BSc, you will do research um, in whether it's a whole year of research or part, part of research, but you will not be able to do it outside the country. And once again, summer holiday research, also doing outside the country is really difficult unless you know someone who's, uh, you know, who's happy to go out of the way to make a, create a space for you. It's just that the, 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 the legislations and the procedures have become so difficult now. It was always difficult for me to uh, set up the elective took two years. So nowadays for eight weeks coming and doing a research, you know, it's so hard for anyone who has a busy, busy work to try to get you through all the hoops. Certainly in terms of nowadays, you have got this uh, MBBS, um, MSc, one year that you can take to do P uh, research or you can do the M MBBS PhD program. So there are a number of uh, options while you are a medical student when you could do research. Is it necessary to go on the outside, to do research outside Britain? Not really, uh, you know, you can have a perfectly successful career, uh, a very productive career without having gone outside Britain. And most of the people in Britain actually have not gone outside to do research. So it's a luxury, not a necessity. But as I said to you, the question is, where is your ceiling of your ambition? And for me, uh, and I never set a ceiling for my ambition. I didn't just want to be a neurosurgeon and I just didn't want to be just a professor. And sometimes you have to aim for the stars you know, to fall in the, fall in the, uh, a little more, more hill. But, uh, but that was my aim. And as I said, as far as I know, the, the grades have all gone to different places, picked up ideas. What are the disadvantages? I think one of the disadvantages if you take time out is that you fall behind peers. Certainly when I went to Singapore and Switzerland and came back, you know, my, my peers have moved on one year and I did not have that peer pressure. Uh, uh, if I had been with them, then I would have competed with my peers uh, and kept on going at the same rate. Once you fall back, then you kind of, your career starts to take a, a slightly slower turn of events. So for me, that one year, maybe you know, I'll look back at it in 10, 15 years time. And you know, if I did make what you know, some amazing contribution, it will be worth it. But otherwise just be careful taking that one year off because sometimes uh, it might catapult you, but it can, sometimes can take you off your peer group and you might feel that you are just slightly adrift and you are catching up. And certainly it was expensive then, and it will be more expensive now. And certainly I paid Seattle money to do that two months work. And uh, you guys have already got a lot of debt and 12% interest rate coming up. So you have to think twice about going outside to do research, if particularly if you are not getting funded. How we have already looked at time when you do it, we are, to do it, uh, obviously you want to, you know, ideally work in a world-class institution. Uh, because the reason is not because I'm not into prestige, uh, but in a world-class institution, you have got world-class people working and world-class people come to visit it. And so, you know, you do maximize uh, your experience if you work in a world-class place. And, you know, when someone is a world-class, no, it's a different. They are like Messi's or Ronaldo's. They are different. They think different. And every time that I meet anyone, I have never not learned from to quote some quote. I don't know who who had told it. I have never come across anyone who I have not learned from. And uh, and in the same way, what you call when I see uh, someone who's um, senior. I, the main thing is that I'm not so much interested in the golden eggs. I'm interested in how they come up to, how they generate ideas. How are they approaching a problem? How are they approaching the problem professionally? How are they managing uh, you know, the non-academic, non-clinical stuff? So I'm always looking at how other people's mind works. 
and if you see a, a great man or great woman then you can you pick up a lot of ideas from them and the, the, the great ones are really different from a very good or excellent and you have to have a defined project that's very important because you know you have to have something to show for you when you come it has to be a presentation it has to be a um, it has to be a paper um, but not it doesn't necessarily absolutely have to be in a holistic sense but in a real world it really helps because if someone asks you what did you do you can ease because there will be always people to knock you and you can say oh i got a paper or i got a presentation out of it uh, you have to be careful because when I got invited to Singapore, the neurosurgeon who invited me, um, uh, what you call for political reasons, had to move into private sector. So he did still supervise me, but from being the chairman of the department, now my my godfather is out of the department and the, the, the guy who led the mutiny was the chairman. And so I really had to survive in that uh, slightly hostile environment. So, you know, you have to be prepared that your plan might go awry on the first day. And the mentor, you know, it's absolutely important to get the right mentor because you can be in a big research lab and you can end up being the bottom of the, bottom of the pecking order. But if you don't have, you know, close contact with a mentor, you know, as I said to you earlier, the main thing is not the research. You are not going to solve the world's problem in say eight weeks or in three months or even a year. But the main thing is not the project, it's working with a, a successful person who's a mentor, world-class, picking up ideas. And that's where for me is the most important part of a research um, is, uh, uh, that's the most important. Of course, other things come into it, learning techniques, paper, but the most important is how, how the goose thinks. Uh, and you have to obviously go to the safe place. So if, for example, I'm, I'm a Sri Lankan, uh, obviously Sri Lanka is not safe. There's an MRC unit there. You could go and do research in uh, um, uh, various areas, certainly maxillofacial, if you are interested in infection with these MRC units in, in other countries, but you know, it's not safe. Uh, India, once again, it's a growing power, but at the moment, if you are of certain religion, then the country is hostile. So you have to figure out, is, that, is this country safe to go? I've already mentioned about mentors. The most important thing for me, you going and doing a research in another place is having an enthusiastic mentor who has ongoing project, who has a publication record, and he's proud to have you in his lab. Is proud to have you visit. I mean, you know, you wouldn't believe how how well Doctor you probably Doctor Dick Win at that time was one of the leading neuroscientists of the world. He's still the editor of the the Bible of neurosurgery. But you know, he was he had a faculty full of absolute stars. But he was absolutely proud that I was there. And you know, it's a for a for any good mentor. Uh, you know, he has to, a good mentor is someone who is proud of having a medical student, proud of having a foreign medical student, um, because we, you know, they will know they are the future and it's for them to give all the pearls that they have learned. So for me, um, that's the most important for me. Funding, as I said to you earlier, you can look through a, a book that's called a charity book for medical charities which gives scholarships and studentships. I used to have it when I was in Aberdeen and you know, speak to your lecturers. And usually the, the saying goes that if the student is ready, the teacher arrives. And if you are motivated, if someone sees that you are motivated as Dr. Schiff said, when he goes and asks people to, if they see that you are motivated, they'll, they'll do all they can to help you. But you have to be super motivated. You have to be super reliable. But if you say something, it has to be absolutely done. And because most clinicians are unbelievably busy, and if they are taking, you know, one minute, five minutes to spend time with the medical student, you have you can't waste their time. You can't, uh, you know, if you say that you are going somewhere, you absolutely have to go because otherwise, it just will affect other students who might 
want to do when they say, oh, I had a bad time last time from UK, so no, I ain't doing it. So you have to, if you're pursuing something, you have to be sure that that's what, that you will definitely come to finish it. Plan it. If you are going to a foreign country, it will take time. There are a lot of paperwork for the other departments to go through. As I said, that's, getting a medical student doesn't have a short-term gain for any research lab. Uh, it might have a long-term gain, but it's usually they are doing it out of their good heart to help someone to um, you know, a future star. But nowadays, you know, most important thing is for a lab is to create a paper, or publish a paper uh, in a good index journal, uh, get grant money. It's a dog eat world. They are dog eat dog world. They are, there's not much place for charities and being nice to people. So, you know, you have to start early uh, to get you know, whatever you know, your, your plans through. So we are to do it. You know, um, in America is still the top place in the neuro, you know, certainly I know, as I said, of neurosurgery, you know, most of the research still comes from America. Most of the clinical advancements still come from America. Certainly there are some breakthrough um, uh, neurosurgery that comes from Europe, uh, from UK. But as soon as they are, they are started in UK or Europe, then America then it takes the balls and runs away with it. And that's why I started my education and neurosurgery work uh, and tried to make sure that there was a counterbalance in North America. So, you know, in, in, if you go back 40, 50 years ago, 30, 40 years ago, most of the neurosurgical residents will come to Britain to spend three months or six months because you know, Britain was the, uh, the leading edge then. But now, you know, the, the, the academic world is dominated by North America. So certainly North America. Um, and the, the other thing about North America is people are warm and uh, uh, very inclusive. And, you know, they really make you feel at home. Um, uh, I went to Switzerland and they were nice to me because it was a friend who, the friend I met in Seattle who invited me. But, you know, Europe, um, including Britain, it's not that friendly, that warm compared to America. Um, so I will certainly say, you know, Europe, the mainland Europe does great work. But I think if you go to North America, it's one of the happiest moments when you come back that you will relive many a times. Singapore, again, in my days, Singapore was one step behind Britain, but now Singapore has gone several steps ahead of us. They have brought you know, the best neuro, best physician from US as well as UK. And they really have developed very well their infrastructure. So uh, it's a good place uh, uh, to do science, but not necessarily culturally. Uh, it's still a very restrictive regimen, but you will meet uh, you know, all, all cultures as in, uh, in the Chinese world, American world, European world, uh, Indian world, uh, so and the, and also cutting edge work. But as I said, I would still say being in America is probably something that you look. You know, I been I've, I've been in Singapore, but every time I say anything about my time, I'll go back to my days in Seattle, um, and not necessarily my days in Singapore or or to Bern. Uh, Australia, those of you in Britain. Um, for Australia is a nice place to go. You might have some family connections and uh, you might enjoy Australia after your research. But once again, um, many British neurosurgeons have, many British uh, doctors have links to Australia, either they spent. So if you, if you, whatever, you are not going to be able to get these research positions on your own. It has to be someone you have worked with in your department, in your university, who has full trust of you and who, who thinks highly of you, who's then going to contact uh, someone in North America or Australia to say, you know, this is a guy well worth giving a chance. And as I said, uh, and also you can look at the MRC units. There, there must be some in Africa. There are certainly in Sri Lanka, maxillofacial. 
Uh, and since they are actually British, you might be able to get time to spend in those cutting edge units. Um, I, I run in the neurosurgery research listserv, which has got about 900 neurosurgeons. So I, I asked them, anyone in states who, who's, who will be willing to take medical students. And uh, there's one from Dubai as well. And uh, I'll send you the link. I'll put the link to this presentation in the chat box. You can look at these. Dr. George Jallo uh, at Johns Hopkins. Uh, it's a renowned pediatric neurosurgeon. I've known him for 25 years now. Uh, he was a resident. I was a medical student. We have worked uh, together since then. Once again, he's on the ball. He's absolutely reliable, but you have to make him this a serious, you know, very, very busy neurosurgeon. Uh, he's director of the Brain Neuroprotection uh, Institute there. Uh, if, if he knows that you are absolutely willing, you know, he will he will walk anywhere to get you there to do research. But, you know, I'm talking about you really have to, these people are top because they are, their attitude is top and they usually will be sweet to you, but they want to be sure that you are all the time on your toes and getting, um, you know, moving things along. Dr. Ayla Mokal in University of Arkansas, she's a Turkish doctor who went and did a, her residency in Yale, and she's an associate professor in uh, University of Arkansas. Uh, there you can do observership. I don't think you can do research or extensive. For that, like Dr. Dr. George Jallo, he's the chief physician in at the Johns Hopkins at St. Petersburg. You need to have someone who's quite powerful enough, who's able to create exceptions for you to be able to work in the lab or in the clinic. Um, it's not, a, you know, you have to be high up in the system to be able to try to, uh, try, to uh, uh, try to do that. That's what happened for me in, in Seattle. Uh, Dr. Hankinson, he's at the University of Colorado. He spent one year in Oxford uh, at the evidence-based medicine unit um, in the Cochrane unit. So in oh. the he's very, He's very familiar with the British system and uh, having been in Oxford, he will be keen to help you guys come to States. But once again, you have to clarify whether it's going to be observership or whether you can actually do research or whether you can actually spend time in the clinic. Uh, then in Sick Kids, they have got an education center. Um, and this is the person who runs the education center. They, are, they do take elective students. So you can write to them and ask, whether you, you whether you can do a research elective uh, and uh, and whichever your specialty is. Same with Dr. Jamila Buzad in Abu Dubai. This is the education center there, and you can write and find out whether you can do a research uh, uh, elective. So, in conclusion, I think in Britain having that elective two months period. Uh, it's uh, in many ways unique opportunity. I don't think in America you you can go and do externship, but I don't think when you are a medical student you can go to another medical school during the term time to do research. Certainly in UK you can plan it well and plan it early. Uh, as I said, it took me at least two two years. I might say even two to three years to get that Seattle one. I think it's very rewarding professionally, personally. Um, I think you will, you know, you will find it it you know, very rewarding throughout your career. That time that you spend um, outside in a foreign country, and as I said, uh, you know, I will I will push, I will recommend you North America, over Canada, Europe, or even Singapore, because uh, the American neurosurgeons work extremely hard. They are amazingly hardworking people. And they like hardworking people and they treat people who work hard. So thank you very much uh, for um, giving me the opportunity to give you this talk. Uh, and I'm uh, happy to answer the questions. Um, Miraj, do you want to just remind me the question that you asked um, for both to both of us earlier? Yeah, of course. So that question was, basically it was just, pretty much what you've been talking about today but um if there were any opportunities for medical students to get involved 
with these kind of big international projects and if if it is more specialized how would they kind of do that because like for example dr shift's talk was quite uh you know a very specific area with spina bifida and things like that how do you pursue something more specialized in an international level sure um let's say that i'm a medical student today okay how do i go about going to states um, to do a research um, i already mentioned to you that it was hard enough then it's even more harder now because of um, uh, the, all the rules and regulations and the covid and uh, and also nowadays um, i'll be honest with you nowadays teaching medical student is not not what it used to be okay there are so many so many hassles now being a physician uh, certainly in uk that you know you want to reduce as much as hassles in your life as you could and certainly the first one you want to chop off sadly is the medical students because um, uh, and you know and the, and so in, in the old days you know if a medical student is coming you know the departments are excited there was a, when i was in one prestigious hospital there was a resident from austria who wanted to come and visit my department and i knew the resident and uh, and my my I, i said to her to write to my senior colleague in the old days you know she would have got reply from everyone nowadays no one bothered and i was so disappointed so the the thing is that the, the world has changed from my days from being where medical students were part of the family and now the aim is to have as less hassle as possible so so the challenge is much harder than my days and as i said my day it was harder so but if i want to achieve something i will get i will still go after it so if i am a medical student how do i go so the first thing is that you want to know what area you are interested i was pretty sure that i was interested in brain or i was interested in neurosurgery and so first of all you have to know what area that you are interested and it has to be a absolute interest it, you know it can you know it can be i'm interested in oncology and i'm also in, interested in neurosurgery um what you call because there are two completely different mindsets and attitudes and if someone says both of them you know that they are not interested in either of them and um, uh, uh, so once you know what that you are particularly interested in then you have to find someone in your university who is um who in that field and you have to find someone who is uh, absolutely keen uh, in his work and he is keen to be a mentor and uh, now i did my bsc in pathology and i still love pathology but after working with the pathologists in my medical school uh, i realized that i needed to work with different people in my life <laughs> and so the thing is that it's important to have the right people enthusiastic happy people to work with so you have to, so if let's say that you want to work in um, in uh, dermatology um, then you have to find someone in your department in your university who's interested in dermatology who's a keen who has a research interest and then you have to form a relationship it's the same as mother and child a, a relationship between a mentor and mentee is a bond so if you work hard they would usually work hard and there's a mutual respect and mutual fondness that you know you, you kind of become their, their academic child and they will go and help as much as they can and it has to be that bond if there's not that bond between you and the boss uh, that you are doing research with believe me nothing is going to happen because they have to go on their limb to write a letter to someone who they know in america to say look miraj is worth it miraj is worth the time for you to spend get him to your department all the hassles that you need to go to is a guy who is reliable when he comes he will work hard then he is a star in waiting and for him to form that impression you have to have bonds i have people i you know medical students who work with me 
and the, you know I do the project such and this I correct send them blah 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 then I never hear a single word from them. It's amazing. I know the modern world has changed, but this is an absolute bond that you have to form, and it's through that bond you are going to get. Uh, without that, you are not going to get to a foreign university. Sure, anything is possible in life, but it has to be an established consultant or neurosurgeon or consultant who's going to use his links to pull you through. Then you have to get the funding. As I said, um, one of my friends was from Seattle and she always managed to find funding. If you, But you have to work hard. You have to look through the charity books, that and this. I never went through the charities to get money because I always felt that whether the money that I take from the charity uh, is you know, whether I justify for the money that people give from charity, but certainly there's always funding, funding avenues. And um, so, but that's why I said plan early. And then when you go to that place, you know, that two months, you really have to work day and night. You know, you wouldn't believe how hard Americans work. So if you're going to go to North America, you know, I was, I was one in three on call as a medical student in, in America for that one month. And for the research lab, I will be there at six o'clock in the morning. Okay. And so you really, you know, you have to set time to do your holiday, you know, sightseeing, um, maybe at the weekend. And in America, they work five and a half days in my days. One, you know, half of Saturday is also work. So, so this is what uh, I would say. You have to start early. You have to have, form a bond, do a research project with someone local and someone who has a link to um, some sort of professional link to uh, a foreign country and then get them to uh, get, form a link. For me, the, the Atkinson Mole link helped. So that's how I see it. And I'll leave to Dr. Shiv. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Shiv, do you have any thoughts? Uh, I was sitting here uh, just smiling, thinking about some of the people who've intersected with your life, uh, as well as mine. Uh, uh, Bob Harbaugh, um, uh, you know, you talk about believing in someone who wants to work hard and has dreams. Bob, unreasonably, I think, um, thought that my vision of what I want to try to do was worth supporting before it was worth supporting. And he stuck by me and we struggled to make things work. And over the years, I credit him with the primary reason that what I showed you all today was, I hope, uh, uh, good. The other person, which I think brings to, to mind several things is Lindsay Simon. And Lindsay wasn't just a, a, a master surgeon and as you say, a, a leader in the United Kingdom along with a few notable others. Um, but he was an incredible scientist and some of his research papers he did as a very young man are valuable today. And you know, he, he came up with the concept of the ischemic penumbra. I did my PhD thesis on that. And when he visited our university, he went and visited me as a worthless student, came and sat down in the, in the chair in my office and talked to me like he had nothing else to do. I, I'll never forget that visit. So, you know, as you go through your careers, um, you really can have an outsized influence when you do these visits and when you do travel, not just with the people who are senior and powerful, but the people who have dreams and ambition someday to be excellent in medicine and maybe to contribute knowledge to medicine. And uh, for everyone on the call, always keep that in mind. If it answered your question, that question, right? I think so, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Go for it. I think the, the thing is that, um, you know, when I was a medical student, I was kind of a, 
what you call um, outlier. Uh, uh, what I did was really done by other medical students that I know of. Or, but now I get a lot of CVs from medical students and I tell you, I mean, you all guys are doing as much or better than I did when I was a medical student. You wouldn't believe, uh, Dr. Shift, the, the CVs of current medical students are. Because our residency system has come like American system. Because in the old days, we did a house job, SHO, then we applied for residency. Now, the, the residency is based mainly on their medical school record. And so for you guys, it's, uh, you, know, you guys are doing great. You know, as I said, I'm, I'm always impressed with the CVs from the current medical students. And, and uh, I think the important thing about this research is that you need to, you know, if you do PhD, then you need to keep that, uh, it shouldn't be if to get a, get a training post. You need to keep it up. What happens is that when you become a consultant, you know, remember your days when you tried to get to medical school and that was the biggest thing ever in the whole universe. And then once you become a medical student after, three months or five months, you say, oh, I'm just a medical student. <laughs> this is the same thing happens when you become a consultant. After five years, when someone asks you, what are you, I'm just a brain surgeon. And uh, unless you are you know, into research, um, you know, your, your brain, you, know, you, just, you, know, you, you don't develop um, as a person, as a, as a, as a neurosurgeon. Uh, and you wouldn't believe the amazing richness that you do when you do research with having research students and discussing research matters with other other physicians it's it's like you know a beautiful garden otherwise it becomes just going to mcdonald's and uh, so i think you have to see this as a, as a as i said i see doing research as a, a, a holistic big thing because it's you who will be the leaders of tomorrow and the, whoever come behind you, you will be giving these talks to the medical students, you know, in 20 years time. And they look up to you and they will then, you know, they will try to do better than you. And, uh, and you guys are doing better than me. And I hope you guys, you know, the next generation does better than you. So you have to, uh, the reason that you are today attending this meeting at this time shows that, you know, I expect great things from you. and so. That's how I see it. It's not for the job. It's not for to become a, a consultant. Um, it's more than that. You can easily become a consultant without doing research, the minimum research. Um, but I'm not looking to see, uh, I'm me or Dr. Shifa are not here to give talk to someone just want to be a consultant. We are expecting and we are hoping that, you know, we will look back in 20 years time and think, you know, Tulika was there and, uh, you know, could have been proud to have given this talk to her. So you know, from my point of view, you guys are welcome to ask me any question, you know, write back to me later on any advice. But as you know, Dr. Schiff, he mentioned Dr. Haber, and I have known Dr. Haba since 2010, okay? And he's, you know, he has steered American neurosurgery, not just Hershey. And you wouldn't believe how humble he is, um, but you wouldn't believe how hardworking he is. You know, you send an email to him, you will get a reply back within five minutes. And he's the most busiest man in the universe. Uh, in neurosurgery, but you know, you get a reply back. Then I send it to my boss when I was training. You know, I wouldn't get a reply back forever. And uh, but that's the difference between a top guy and a not so top guy. Okay. And so, but if you find people who, you know, who are there to give their time, please appreciate it and be there on it. Because, you know, as I said, you know, Two of my residency, Dr. Harbas in 2010, you know, he was more supportive than any of my own trainees were. And that's because he, he knew I was motivated. I, I was someone who he, he 
he could, you know, he 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 thought I was reliable. So, you know, it doesn't not me, but whoever you you contact, you have to be on the toes. And that was another medical student I was um, mentoring about three years ago, and I had two projects, and uh, you know, one project he did, the second project, you know, he was too busy, and. You know, to be honest, um, I, I, thankfully, I, it didn't put me off medical students, but make sure that after you, whoever the mentor should feel, you know, that was a rewarding experience. I, when the next medical student comes, they want to, you know, enthusiastically support them as well. Thank you. If, if you have any other questions, happy, but otherwise, I'm happy to give it back to you, Neeraj. No, thank you so much. Some very motivational words. And I think myself and everyone here, we've learned a lot. So yeah, if there are any other questions and things, um, obviously, we have your contact details. So if you want, so people can write into us and we can forward you questions. Or, you know, if there's any, any pending last minute questions people want to ask now, then feel free to do it. And I think the one last point I will say is that, you know, as I mentioned earlier, certainly in Britain, you can become a consultant without research. You certainly can spend your whole career um, in British neurosurgery without doing research. I just want to quickly, Niraj, an important distinction. <laughs> I want to let you know about the Britain and America. And you see, when I was a medical student, I thought professors was the, <coughs> The, the big you know, was the ultimate goal. Like I come from a family of professors. I come originally from Sri Lanka and certainly in America, chairman, professor <laughs> is the end of the line. But in Britain, it's completely different in medicine, okay? I don't know how many of you know because I did not know this until I actually got into medical practice. In Britain, NHS hospitals, I'll just kill NHS hospitals are basically service providers. They are basically like a private hospital, but these are hospitals which are basically contracted to the government, okay? So their aim is basically service. How many operations, how many outpatients, how many patients you have treated. They have no interest in research. It doesn't create income. That's not what they were. So British hospitals are basically service providers. You may consider them like a private hospital, but with a private hospital with one payer that's gone. Okay. So if you go into a British hospital and say you are interested in research, the hospital is not interested. Your consultants are not really that much interested. Okay. Because doing research doesn't actually help you in your career to go up the NHS, okay? So that's something I did not know. I thought, <coughs> I did not know that because every other country in the world, Europe, India, America, the professor is the, the main, the, 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 the goal, okay? Not so in Britain. So in Britain, if you come to my department or you know, if you come to every department, you have got uh, consultant, but there are two kinds of consultant. Okay, in a neurosurgical department, let's say with a con 10 consultant neurosurgical department, eight will be employed by the NHS. Two will be employed by the university. Okay, the eight people who are employed by the NHS, they are paid by the NHS. Many of them will be honorary consultants in the university, but they are, it's an honorary appointment, no money, they just come, give lectures, they go, they'll get the email address, but it's honorary. Same way, the other way, the two consultants who are employed by the university, they are honorary consultants in the NHS, okay? So their time is split between research and clinical work. Their clinical work is usually less than other consultants work. So they usually have less, less say in the departmental running. Okay, so they are usually on the periphery of a NHS department. Okay, and the, it gets even worse. 
If that was bad enough, it gets worse. Because if you are associated with a junior, if you are a consultant neurosurgeon associated with a university, the university at maximum only gives you five year contract. Okay. So in the five years, if you don't bring enough money in research grants and enough papers in high level journals, then the university will terminate your contract at the end of the five years. Okay. If that happens, then you automatically lose the job in the hospital because you were never, never employed by the hospital, you were employed by the university, okay? Then if you are, then in case that the NHS hospital then advertises for that post that you have left, then you can apply, but there's no guarantee that they will appoint you, okay? And in terms of Britain, you are paid in what's called PAs, so, the average, most consultants are pay, paid 10 PAs. So 10 PAs means on average, you are working four days. Eight, so half a day is a PA. So for the first four days, four days in a week, you get eight PAs and two PAs you get for professional advancement uh, or, or teaching and those things. So you, you on average, most consultants get 10 PAs. So if you are an academic, if you are an academic professor, then you will have about five PAs with university and five PAs with hospital, okay? But all, all that pay is still coming from the university, okay? So you are kind of a part-time surgeon, part-time physician. Sure, neurosurgery in the great scheme of things is a small specialty. Let's say that you are in general surgery or you are in internal medicine, then you, you will have more say as an academic, academic physician or academic general surgeon in the running of the university and also have clout in the hospital. Uh, but, you know, but the rule is that uh, um, it's not what you think, uh, uh, what you think, you know, what I had the thought when I was in British University. So this is very British system. And once again, you can have all the papers that you want unless you know, it appears in nature and you are bringing a lot of research and then suddenly hospital will say, oh, he works in my hospital. But until that, they don't really care. And if you, if you are a surgeon, unlike in America, if you are a surgeon in Britain and if you are interested in research, majority of the people in your department will be people who don't do research. So they will start knocking you saying, oh, he's an academic guy, he can't cut. Okay, so I don't, you know, I want you still guys to do research because I want you to be the next Lindsay Simon. I want you to be the leaders, but understand how the, the logic works. But nowadays, the main thing that you guys need to do research is that because trying to get into training program, which is very, very competitive, the research, how much research you have done in medical school is used to um, see who is more brighter to give the residency post. But once you get into the residency, they don't really care about your research record. Okay, so I hope that, you know, I know this is not a romantic thing that I have told you, but I think this is an important thing that you have to understand. Okay. And, but just remember the all the things that we do in medicine today in neurosurgery today is because someone bothered to do research before so it's it's our moral uh, forget about career forget about contribution but i think it's a moral duty of every physician to try to do research because we have we benefit what we practice today is based on what others have done and it's for us to contribute for the next generation thank you guys any questions about the medical school university split? Just happy to take any questions. So it's very different from um, academic centers in states, the um, doctorship. It's a completely different world. I really like that because like, I don't think enough people talk about the honest reality of like working at, in an in a academic post. I've been quite fortunate that I've had colleagues and people around me tell me these things. But like, if you don't know and you don't have the jobs, you're not going to know like what an honorary consultant does and all these other things. So they're very good to find out early. I think most people are, as you said, 
uh, most people, uh, you know, in in world in, in world, it's how much um, impression that you give, uh, you know, and uh, most people wouldn't always like to say the the good good reflection. You know, they don't. You know, when I did not know these things either. So that's what I'm keen, guy, you guys, to go to states or go to or go to Canada, because at the moment there are about seventy neurosurgery residents who have completed their training without a consultant post, okay? And that's a huge number for a small country. And so, you know, I will say that make sure that when you are in medicine, you know, try to do your USMLEs. America is not the, you know, honey and the milk and honey place. I know America too well. Uh, I never hear a single American neurosurgeon ever complain about the American system. Um, my only feeling is that it's probably that bad that they are they dare not ever complain about it. But um, once you go, I'm sure Dr. Ship is not going to agree with it or disagree with it, but because I know the American corporate system as well. But the thing is that um, you know, working in Britain is, is a nicer system, but trying to get in is hard. So, you know, you, for example, if you are a pediatric interested in pediatric neurosurgery, if I had known that, if you go to America and do a fellowship, if I had, had the US family, then go and do the fellowship, then you don't have to do residency to get a pediatric neurosurgery consultant post in America. So there are these things, um, and I don't know whether some places like Arkansas and Nebraska, whether they need US family. So just try to find, the reason about America is that I'm not saying America is, you know, certainly it has fantastic uh, record and it, it is the engine of medicine and neurosurgery. But the thing is that in Britain, it's NHS. Either you are in NHS or you are not. It's a complete monopoly. Your career depends on you getting into NHS. At least in the States, you can be in academic, you can be in private, you can be in, you know, you can be in Nebraska or you can be in Hershey or you can be somewhere else. So the options in America are much in Britain. Either you are in NHS or you are not in NHS. It's the full stop. You can't do private work without being a consultant in the NHS. It doesn't, you will never get any patient coming to you. Dr. Shif, any, any thoughts or I think? Oh, no, I, I mean, uh, we could all spend all of our time and energy complaining about uh, the difficulty of everything. I think uh, you really have to figure out a way to, not dwell on the difficulties of being in medicine and handling our jobs that are very stressful if you do high risk, high uh, uh, mission critical medicine and uh, to focus on what's good in it. Absolutely, I think Mr. Sengupta, he was a renowned neurosurgeon. He used to say, if you want diamonds, then you have to go through the mud. And uh, so, so you know, the, the important thing is to help patients, and which is an amazing, amazing privilege. You know, if you manage to say one life, that makes, like I say to my medical students, your mother carrying you nine months, certainly that's, that's enough, well worth it. So at the end of the day, you are there for patients. But reality is that you, know, you have to have a pay to cover your roof, you know, pay the bills, uh, have a family, you know, if you are the 70 residents who, who have finished their training and no jobs and jumping from the third fellowship, then, you know, it's difficult to see for them the world in, a, in an idealistic way. So one has to have both, both sides as well. I'm going to have to leave and get to the meeting. Uh, uh, if there's any other questions that we can't address here, I'll try to answer by email. Yeah, we'll take any we'll take anything that comes in and email you through. But anyway, thank you both so much. This was super. Yep. Cool. Yep. You're very welcome. Hope you found it useful. All the very thank best, you. guys. Thanks. Nice meeting you, Steve.